Welcome uh, to our second week of uh, Theories of Personality. Today, we're going to start covering chapter two. We're gonna start covering uh, the psychoanalytic approach, Freud's theory of personality. A lot of you have heard about Freud before, and you probably already know some of these things, but we're gonna learn maybe a, a bit more um, than you've heard before, okay? So let's get started. Um, so let's talk about Freud's theory. Okay, see the thing about Freud, uh, Freud actually uh, believed in this. Okay, we've all probably heard of instincts. Instincts are things that are kind of inborn, innate, things that uh, we can't help. Okay, Just things that we do naturally, so to speak. And according to Freud, okay, we are driven by two kinds of instincts. Okay, we're driven by instincts. Okay, so basically we have these internal drives towards certain actions. And there's two kinds of instincts that drive us, okay? Life instincts and death instincts. So life instincts are drives for survival, food, water, air, sex. So life instincts are things that promote life, okay? Things that we do to help us survive, right? We seek food, we need water, we need air. Uh, we look to develop relationships and mate with people. All that basically is the life instinct. Uh, kind of uh, asserting itself, telling us we need to do certain things in order for us to survive. The life instinct is driven by uh, a type of energy that Freud called the uh, libido, the libido, okay? So it's the energy that drives life instincts. And some of you, or a lot of you probably heard of the libido, basically your sex drive. Um, so uh, yeah, the libido is the energy that drives these life instincts, uh, that promotes uh, survival. And if you think of it broadly, yes, um, sex is basically related to everything that has to do with survival. Okay, so when it, you know, whether it comes to uh, you know, forming relationships, romantic relationships, uh, settling down, having children, you know, even getting a job so you can provide for those children, you know, and uh, you know, providing for your, for your offspring, for your, your loved one. Um, a lot of these things, of course, the, you know, the need for food, water, all those things. Um, all those things promote, promote survival. So Freud called those life instincts and they're driven by the kind of energy that he called libido. According to Freud, we're also driven by death instincts. We also have drives toward destruction and aggression. Turns out, according to Freud, that we also want to kill each other and hurt each other. And the energy that drives that, Freud called thanatos. Okay, so that's that energy that drives death instincts. Thanatos. Okay. Um, it's been said that Freud came up with this idea, uh, thanatos, the uh, you know, energy that drives us to want to kill each other or hurt each other. Later in his life, uh, Freud actually um, you know, lived through a uh, through, through World War II. I'm not sure he lived to the end of it, but um, he got to see World War I and uh, <clears throat> most of World War II, I believe. And he got to see the, you know, the awful things that human beings do to each other. He got to see, you know, the destruction and the chaos and the murder and the, you know, the incredible death. And it made him pessimistic later in his life. And it's been said that that's where he got this idea about the, uh, the death instinct, that we're naturally driven, instinctively driven to basically kill, kill each other and destroy each other. And that's why we fight. That's why we argue. That's why we go to war. So that's what Freud believes. We're driven by instincts, things we can't help, things that are inborn and natural. Um, instincts to promote life, to ensure survival and reproduction. And then there's the instinct to destroy. <clears throat> so some general things here. Let's keep going. Let's talk about something you've probably heard of, and those are the levels of personality. So according to Freud, um, we have uh, three levels of consciousness. Okay. So this you probably heard of before. So we have a conscious mind. Okay. And that's just the feeling. It's just feelings, thoughts, memories that we are aware of. So your, comp your conscious mind basically just has to do with those things that you're aware of, 
you're aware of, for instance, that, you know, I'm giving you this lecture and you're looking at these slides. That's what you're aware of. That's your conscious mind. Your conscious mind is what you basically control. What you're thinking about at the moment, what you are doing at the moment is part of your conscious mind. What you are conscious of, what you are doing right now, and you're doing it because you control it, because you choose to. That is your conscious mind. We also have a pre-conscious mind. Um, a pre-conscious mind has to do with feelings, thoughts, memories, or those things that we are not normally aware of, but we can easily become aware of. And these are not examples that have to do with personality, but just to give you an idea of what we mean by the pre-conscious mind, right? We're talking about that part of the mind that has to do with things that we normally don't notice, but we can easily notice. Like maybe there's noise outside, maybe there's cars, there's traffic, maybe construction or something. But let's just say cars, okay? Um, and uh, usually you don't notice that in your house. You kind of tune it out, okay? But you can easily notice it and become aware of it and then complain about it. Now there's all these cars passing by, right? But normally you tune those things out. You're not thinking about them. They're in your pre-conscious. So it's, it's things that you normally don't think about, you can easily, but you can easily think about. Uh, another example, still not related to personality, we'll eventually talk about things directly related to personality, uh, would be your, um, you know, uh, breathing. You know, breathing is something you normally don't think about, it just happens. But you can easily think of it and take control of it, speed it up, slow it down, right? It's kind of in your pre-conscious. It's something that's there, that you usually don't pay attention to, just below the surface, but when you become, when you focus on it, then you're thinking about it. So it's a pre-conscious. And then we have the unconscious, the unconscious mind. So the unconscious has to do with feelings, thoughts, memories that we're not aware of. So those are, so the unconscious mind basically stores things or has to do with things that we usually are not thinking about uh, that we don't control and we may not even know exist. We have things hidden deep in our mind, according to Freud, deep in the unconscious. Memories, thoughts, feelings, things, uh, things that have to do with uh, experiences that happened long ago. Your childhood memories, according to Freud, are there, those traumatic experiences. All of it is there, according to Freud, uh, buried in your unconscious. You don't control it. It controls you. And according to Freud, your unconscious is basically pretty much the main part of your personality, is what determines who you are. Most of what determines who you are, according to Freud, are things that have to do with, with um, experiences you had as a child that shaped you, that scared you, that you know, uh, made you think about certain things. And those memories are still there, according to Freud. Those feelings are still there. You may not be able to consciously think about them, Maybe you don't remember them, but according to Freud, they're all there. Uh, an example there, maybe not a good example there, but your need to be with others. You have that need, right, to be with others. You don't control that. It's just the way you are. We're social. We need to be with other, with other people. That's part of the unconscious mind, according to Freud. Okay, we don't control it. It controls us. Um, maybe you're a very fearful person. And it may be because when you were a child, you know, um, something really scared you. You had a traumatic experience where, you know, maybe, maybe you almost died or something, or maybe somebody broke into your house. Remember being really scared. Remember the police arriving, or maybe you don't remember those things, but you had that very fearful experience. And according to Freud, uh, that experience might make you a little bit more neurotic, a bit more fearful today. So the unconscious mind has to do with those things basically that are buried deep in our minds. We don't control it. It controls us. And it has everything to do with the way we feel, the way we think, and the way we behave today. It is what actually determines who we are. The conscious mind is whatever you're thinking about at the moment. Okay? You're focusing on this lecture, or maybe you go outside and you get something to eat, or you take a drive somewhere. That's your conscious mind. That's not really your personality, according to Freud. That's just what you're doing right now. And then your pre-conscious is stuff that's 
between consciousness and the unconscious. Stuff you're usually not thinking about, but you can easily think about. Let me show you an image. So it's kind of like this. There's something known as the iceberg analogy. There's this iceberg floating in the ocean. What you see, the part of the iceberg that, that you see, would be like your conscious mind. That is what you do think about, what you are in control of, uh, what you are aware of, okay? And then there's the stuff that's right below the surface, that's your pre-conscious. The stuff that is just below the surface. You can see it if you look down and you focus on it, you can see that part of the iceberg if you just look down into the water, it's visible. But normally, it's below the surface, normally you're not thinking about it, and you're not aware of it, but you usually, but you easily can become aware of it. And the unconscious mind is the part of the iceberg that's very, that's very deep. The stuff that you don't really see. From the surface, you only see a small percentage of the iceberg. Most of it, 80% or more, is underwater. So it's the stuff that's below awareness. You don't see it. You can't, it's hard to access. And it has everything to do with who you are, with your personality. Biological urges, drives, traumas, fears, passions, all those things are buried in the unconscious. And they have to do with who you are. The unconscious can be accessed through certain techniques that Freud uh, made use of. And we'll get to those later when we talk about his therapy. So that's the iceberg analogy that explains the levels of consciousness. And we also have the structure of personality. Our personality is composed of three structures. And you probably heard of this as well. There's the id, ego, and superego. The id basically is the you know, kind of selfish, impulsive part of you. The id is basically the store of your biological drives, your instincts, things you can't help, right? You just have these drives, these uh, feelings, you have these urges and you can't control them. It's part of who you are biologically. The id demands immediate gratification. So it's the part of you that, you know, that demands food, water, sex, that demands, you know, that your biological urges be satisfied. So when, it, uh, when you're hungry, the it is that part of your personality that says, I'm hungry, I want food, and I want it now. I need to eat. When you're thirsty, same thing, I need some water. When you're sexually aroused, the it is that part of you that says, you know, I'm aroused, I'm horny, whatever you want to call it. And I want sex and I want it now. I, I want to do this. The id operates according to the pleasure principle. In other words, it has needs and it wants to be satisfied. And it derives pleasure from those things. It's pleasurable, you know, to eat food, to have sex, even to drink water if you're thirsty, right? So the id really has to do with your bio biological drives. You are human, you're biological, and you have certain needs and you can't help it. It is who you are. And the it is that part of your personality that's just demanding, selfish, impulsive. I want these things, I need these things, and I want them now. So the id doesn't really think, it doesn't really reason. It's the part of you that behaves like an animal. That's a good way to think about it. It's part of you that behaves like an animal. You need to eat, you need to have sex, you need to drink water, you need to sleep, you need to fart and go to the bathroom, and it just wants things and it demands those things. It doesn't think, it just wants to be satisfied. To make you, help you understand it a, a little bit better, uh, I have a picture there, a little devil there. The id is like that little devil that basically says, come on, just do it. You know you want it, right? Maybe you just met someone and you find him or her attractive. The id's that part of you that says, yeah, we really want to, you know, do this person, have sex with person. Yeah, God, why not? You know, let's, uh, let's do this, right? She wants it, you want it, why not? Okay, or you know what? You know, hey, just drink that alcohol. No big deal, right? You're mad, the it says, you know what? Let's kick this person's ass or let's kill him. You know, if you're really upset, that's the it. It's the part of you that's selfish and impulsive. 
It behaves like an animal. It needs to be tamed. And if you're, the part of your personality that is strongest is the id, then you're basically the kind of person that does you know, what you want, when you want, you don't give a damn what people think, and you probably get into a lot of trouble. Okay, it's selfish and impulsive, and if you behave like an animal, you're gonna get in trouble. And then there's the ego. The ego is the rational part of your personality, the part of you that does think, the part of you that is logical, that reasons. It tries to satisfy the id. It knows that you have biological urges. The ego knows that you need to eat. It, needs, it knows you need to go to the bathroom and that you wanna have sex once in a while. But the ego tries to satisfy those needs in a way that's rational. That basically, uh, you can satisfy those needs in a way that doesn't get you into trouble. You can function normally in society, okay? That's, that's the ego. It also tries to satisfy the super ego, which we'll talk about next, okay? So the, e the ego is rational, it's logical, it thinks, it knows you have needs, it knows you need to live in a society, and it tries to satisfy your urges and help you fit into society uh, and basically, you know, help you adjust to reality. It operates according to the reality principle. So in reality, what can we do? What should, you know, what can we do, right, to satisfy these needs? How should I, you know, how should I behave myself or should I not behave myself? It's that part of you that thinks and reasons. So I have a little image of, your, uh, of a brain there. So it's like your brain, okay, or the part of you that thinks, that has to decide things and, um, you know, and go about things hopefully in a reasonable way. If you're not very smart, your ego probably isn't very strong. But uh, if you wanna be a healthy, uh, psychologically healthy human being, it's best that your ego be strong, that the strongest part of your personality. In other words, you're, you're rational, you're logical. You know that you know, there's things that you need to do, but you try to do them in a way that's intelligent, that's smart, uh, and you know, it operates that way. And then there's the superego. The superego basically has to do with that part of your mind that uh, has been shaped by uh, parental rules, societal rules and standards. Your superego is basically like the mor moral guardian of your personality. It's the things you've been taught by, your, by parents in society. Your parents might have told you, might have taught you things like, don't cheat, don't steal, be a good person, don't be selfish. You learn things in church as well, like, you know, don't have sex. You need to wait until you're married. They tell you things like that in church. You go to school and they tell you, you know, that you need to study, right? Go to class, you know, don't cheat, right? All those things. You need to be a good person. That's your superego. All those rules, all those standards, all those things end up as part of the superego. It's that part of you that says, you need to work hard, be a good worker, be a good citizen. Be a good mother, a good father. Do the right thing. The superego will make you feel guilty and shameful if you do not meet its demands. I have a picture there of a little angel. I know it's, you know, a little angel is supposed to be nice and stuff like that. That little angel is like your superego. It basically tells you, you know, when uh, you want to have sex, it tells you, no, 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 bad boy. Bad girl, right? You know you're supposed to wait until you're married. You're not married. You're too young, right? No, don't, don't smoke those cigarettes. Don't drink that alcohol, right? You're not even old enough. Or don't, don't drink. Alcohol is bad for you. You learn that from class. Don't eat too much. Don't be a glutton. Those kind of things. And you can learn a variety of things from parents and society, from school, all those things. And all those, think of them like rules that you learn. And your superego is important as well. You need to function in a society and the society has rules by which people live by. The thing about the superego, when you don't meet its demands, it makes you feel guilty. So when you feel guilty, for instance, that let's say maybe you took the day off work and you weren't sick, but you just took the day off because let's say you wanted to give yourself a longer weekend. So you took the Friday off 
or the Monday off. The superego is the part of you that makes you feel guilty, makes you feel bad about that. Now, I know some of you may not feel bad about that. It's maybe not a big deal to you. Some people have stronger superegos than others and different rules, you know, could be part of the superego. But it makes you feel shameful. The superego is also that part of you that, you know, tells you you're a bad boy, bad girl, right? You had a one night stand. Superego tells you like, uh, you know, how could you, you know? It's like, uh, you know, how could you be so sleazy? You don't even know this person. That's the superego, makes you feel shameful. When you look in the mirror and you do not like what you see, the superego is that part of you that tells you that you're ugly, that you're fat and disgusting. It's that part of you because you've learned also from parents and society that you need, maybe more from society, that you need to look good and be fit, right? That you need to be smart, all these things. And it's that part of you that makes you feel bad when you don't live up to those standards. So yes, it demands things. Man's that you follow the rule, that you be good, you know, that you do certain things. And when you feel bad, when you don't live up to those things, that's your super ego punishing you. That's that little angel shaking his head saying, you know, that you're bad. Okay. And that little angel actually can be quite, um, quite mean and say you're stupid and ugly. You know, you don't deserve to live and things like that. But you'll never amount to anything, right? Because you're not following the rules. That's that part of you. So there are these three parts, these three structures to your personality. And, and they are, uh, they have to operate, you know, in kind of a together. Uh, and, uh, you know, they determine your personality. And if you're gonna be healthy, like I said, your ego has to be the strongest part of you. Because the ego has to basically satisfy both the id and the superego. The ego says, okay, so I wanna have sex, right? Uh, you know, I know that I have needs, right? And the superego says, no, no, bad boy, bad girl, right? You need to wait until you're married. How, you don't even think about it. You're evil, you're going to hell, that kind of stuff, right? The ego has to reason, you know, use logic. Sometimes that's a compromise. So the ego might decide, you know what? I'm not just gonna go sleeping around with people, you know, you know, who just because I have this urge, people I don't know, right? I'm not gonna behave like an animal. So I'm not, I'm not just gonna give in to you, id, right? And the ego might also say to the super ego, you know what, uh, I have, I, yes, uh, you know, I can't wait until I'm married. I think that's unreasonable. I don't think I should have to wait that long. And if I'm in a relationship and I love the person, the person loves me and we're both responsible, it's probably okay to have sex. That's what the super ego probably, I mean the super ego, the ego probably decides. It operates that way. It kind of tries to balance those two things, you know, the, the, the selfish biological needs with the needs of society and tries to help you, you know, kind of, uh, you know, work that out. Often it's a compromise, helps you op operate uh, uh, rationally, okay? Now, sometimes the ego though might decide to go with the it. You're married, you're in the privacy of your own home, and your partner's there and you're both willing, the ego might say, you know what, it, go ahead, have your way. Let's do this, right? Be as kinky as you want. It's not, it's no problem, okay? Or maybe you're in class, at work, at church or something like that, and the ego might totally go with the super ego. You know what, right now we have to be good, pay attention, work hard, right? Uh, do what we're told, right? We need to follow these rules. But often it's a compromise between your selfish needs and the needs of society, you can't just live for everybody else and just let your super ego dominate. If your super ego dominates, then you're always, you always feel bad, guilty, shameful, you're not good enough, okay? You're always worried. If your id dominates, then you don't give a damn. Then you do whatever you want and you can get into trouble and get yourself killed or uh, thrown in jail, locked up, or you're impulsive, selfish. People can hate you for that. Some people might think you're fun, right? Or a bad boy or a bad girl or something like that, or cool. But you behave like an animal, okay? If you're gonna be well balanced, it's your ego that needs to kind of uh, decide which way to go with the id, with the super ego, some compromise or something like that. Let's keep going. I always say too much with regard to that. Well, I wanted to mention something. These uh, structures of your personality are similar to your levels of consciousness. Some people have said that the id is like basically your unconscious. 
you know, your biological urges, you don't control them. You're often, you don't, I mean, you don't know where they come from. It's kind of like your unconscious mind. The ego uh, is like your conscious mind, the part of you that thinks, that decides. And the superego is the stuff, it's kind of like your pre-conscious. Stuff you usually don't think about, but you can easily think about. Like maybe you're about to, uh, you know, go home with someone you just met. And then that voice pops into your head. It's your mother's voice or your father's voice. It says, uh, you just met this person. You don't know this person. You shouldn't be doing this, right? That's the super ego. That's kind of like the pre-conscious. You're normally not thinking about what your parents have told you and things like that, but you can easily remember those things and it can then affect your behavior. Moving on. Let's talk about threats to the ego. So the ego is the part of you that thinks, part of you that uses logic, tries to have you operate intelli intelligently. Um, there are threats, to, there's anxiety. Anxiety is a, is a problem, okay? It's something that uh, can cause problems. If you're fearful, you're anxious, you don't necessarily behave normally. Now, some kinds of anxiety are kinda okay and useful, others are not so useful, okay? So there's real and objective anxiety. Think of it that like fear of real dangers, real dangers, right? You have a fear of like, you know, bears, of, uh, of, of getting caught in a fire, right? A fear of dying or uh, something, you know, because of real things, real things that can hurt you. That's real and objective anxiety. Uh, that is fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But there's also neurotic anxiety which is not as healthy. Neurotic anxiety is when you have fear or anxiety that's due to conflict between the id and reality. So you have this fear that you're gonna be punished for, you know, for basically, um, for giving in to the, your sexual impulses or your aggressive impulses. Fear that you're gonna be punished because you've been having sex and your parents told you you're not old enough or you're still living under your parents' roof. Your dad's gonna find out and he's gonna, he's gonna beat you or something like that or you're gonna get caught. Or you have this fear that you know, you've been masturbating, something like that, and that uh, you, know, your parent, you fear that you're gonna get caught by your parents, something like that. Or, or be punished because you got into a fight or something. You gave into your id, and it conflicts with reality, okay? So fear of punishment, okay? Think about it that way. And then um, there's moral anxiety. Moral anxiety is fear due to conflict between the id and the superego, okay? Fear of one's own conscious. With moral anxiety, no one is really punishing you other than yourself. So you fear being a bad person because you've been stealing or you had premarital sex. In this case, it's not your parents telling you that they're gonna beat you if you have sex or the policeman that's gonna arrest you, okay? Here, it's you've done something and you feel bad for doing that. It's you punishing yourself for not living up to the standards that you've been taught. That is moral anxiety. And um, you know, that's not as useful. The first one, real objective anxiety, that's fine. Yeah, you know, real fears, you need to pay attention to those. Neurotic anxiety, you have fear that's just, you know, you're doing something and you're gonna get punished for it by someone. Okay, um, not as healthy, but it is there and moral anxiety is, is less healthy. You're punishing yourself. Your super ego is punishing you, making you feel really awful, really bad. Let's keep going. Ego defenses against anxiety. How does the ego defend against this anxiety, right? The rational thinking part of you needs to protect you against this anxiety. Because if you're anxious and fearful all the time, you don't operate very well. You can't think very well. You don't function very well. Relationships don't work very well. Uh, work doesn't work very well. If you're fearful and anxious, basically you're a mess. You're not, you're not doing very well. So the ego, the rational part of your mind, develops these, what are called these defense mechanisms. These ego defenses. Uh, strategies or ways basically that to make things that make you feel better about whatever may be going on 
So they are unconscious ego defenses against anxiety that distort reality. So there are things that make us feel better. So they don't, we, don't, we don't feel so anxious, so fearful. But at the same time, they are distorting reality. And we're not seeing things always the way they really are. And you probably heard of a lot of these. So the first one is repression. Repression is when you purposely make yourself forget something or you forget something. You forget something, okay? So it's motivated forgetting. It's removal of something from consciousness. So there's something that you don't wanna think about, so you forget about it. Something you don't like, right? Like you have a dentist appointment, especially if you're a kid. You might be very fearful of the dentist. Think you're, they're gonna pull out some teeth, you're gonna be in some pain. Um, and uh, actually the example works more with adults. You forget that you have a dentist appointment, you forget to go to the dentist. Freud would say that, you know, you made yourself forget. You didn't want to remember because you don't want to go. You don't want to go through that. Or another example of repression would be, you know, that um, as a child, maybe you were abused physically or even sexually abused, but you don't remember. As an adult, you don't remember. And Freud would say that you do remember it's there but you have repressed the information. You've made yourself forget it so that you can behave more normally. You can function more normally. Because if you think about that, if you think about the fact that you were physically abused or sexually abused, you know, you can get very emotional. You start crying, you start feeling really awful or maybe even scared if you were sexually abused. And then what happens is it causes trouble with relationships. So you have to kind of repress that information to behave more normally. And I know I'm bringing this up. Some of you may be remembering this and it makes you uncomfortable to remember things like that. A lot of people are sexually abused and physically abused. I get emotional often when I think about it and I tell people about my childhood and how things went. But don't get me wrong, my mom wasn't really awful, okay? I don't think she's, she was awful. She did what she had to do, but um, nah, I went through some awful things, which I'll, I'll talk about, you know, later as the semester progresses when we get to some other theories, okay, that apply to what I'm talking about. So repression is you make yourself forget things, okay? So you can make yourself feel better. You forget bad things, things that hurt you, things you don't want to think about. That's called repression. By the way, do not get that confused with suppression. Suppression is not a Freudian term. It is called repression, okay? And then there is denial. Denial is very simple. One way you can make yourself feel better, protect against fear and anxiety, is just to not believe the truth. So maybe you're an alcoholic. And if you were to admit that you're an alcoholic, you would feel awful. And then you would probably need to find, you know, seek help to get better. But if you're in denial, you say that you don't have a drinking problem. You can stop whenever you want. You can control it. You're not an alcoholic. You don't drink that much. You're in denial. It makes you feel better to believe that. You don't really believe the truth. You believe that you don't have a problem. That's denial. That's how you can believe that. Uh, continue feeling good about yourself. I was in denial a little bit. I've been in denial. We're all in denial, by the way, all of us, about many things. But I was in denial about, uh, to some extent, uh, you know, about riding my bike. I have this mountain bike, this electric mountain bike, so I can go up the mountains of Goat Hill and stuff like that. And I'm in denial about getting hurt. There I am going through those hills, those mountains, those little narrow trails, sometimes too fast. And I'm in denial saying, hey, I'll be okay. I'm not gonna hurt myself. Or if I do fall, no big deal. Yesterday I took a nasty spill and I got hurt. And I'm here talking to you guys with a cracked rib, believe it or not. That's how hurt I got. I had a nasty fall yesterday. Got to go to the hospital, but I'm fine. I'm in some pain medication. You know, I don't have as much strength as I could, but I was in denial about that. And now the truth has caught up with me, so to speak. And now I say, God, damn, do I stop writing this thing? What do I do? And maybe I need to wear some, you know, I wear shin guards and a helmet. Luckily I was wearing a helmet, I would probably be dead. I did hit my head on the dirt, but I also hit my ribs. You know, they do sell shirts that have padding on the ribs and stuff. And, um, you know, I guess I need to be a little bit more safer, but um, I was in denial about that. And as I feel better about the pain and I take medication, you know, cause it, it hurts 
a lot when I'm not on the medication. Um, you know, as I feel a little bit better, I'm thinking, yeah, you know, it's not that bad. Yeah, I got hurt. But you know what? I just be, I need to be a little bit more careful. I'll be okay. When you're doing things like that, you know, mountain biking, or maybe you're racing because you, you drive your car too fast or you do things um, and you think nothing's going to happen to you, that is denial. And a lot of young people are in denial and doing all sorts of things that are risky, that could get them killed, get them hurt. And that's what happens. You want to live a long time, stay free from injury and stuff like that. Uh, you have to take a lot of precautions and avoid doing a lot of things. But of course, I like the outdoors and I like to do things and uh, I don't think it's going to stop me. It's not the first time I fall. This is like the third time. But this is the first time I was actually seriously hurt. Crack rib, okay? That's what I have. And, uh, you know, it hurts, but I'm, some, I'm on some good medication. And uh, I'll be fine. I'm not going to ride that thing probably for like six weeks until I'm completely healed. But I probably will end up getting back on it and continue to be in denial. But, yeah, I could end up killing myself. But, you know, the brain is what matters the most, and it's protected very well by the helmet. So we're all in denial about all sorts of things, about how long we're going to live, how good looking we are. We're in denial. It helps us feel better about ourselves. There's also reaction formation. Reaction formation is a little bit harder to understand. Reaction formation is when you react against uncomfortable it impulses. You have a certain impulse and you do the opposite because it makes you uncomfortable to basically be truthful to that. So let's say you feel lustful. You're turned on, you're feeling horny, whatever you want to call it. But uh, you um, believe that that's wrong, that's bad or something like that. Maybe you're religious, something like that. Uh, so instead, you become more religious or you run to church or something like that. Whenever you have these feelings that come up, you know, these, these biological urges, you kind of, um, you do something to combat them where you act in the opposite way. So you're feeling very lusty and instead you go read your Bible. You run to church or something like that, okay? Um, or maybe if um, you're, uh, you're afraid you might be gay or something like that. It makes you uncomfortable. So what do you do? You act really macho, okay? So you react in the opposite way of what the truth really is. Let's keep going. There's also projection. Projection is a little bit easier to understand. With, when you project, what you're doing is you're actually accusing other people of things that are actually true about you. So you attribute your undesirable characteristics to others. Say so you're difficult, right? You're a difficult person. You're hard to get along with. You yell, you scream, you fight with people a lot. But you say there's nothing wrong with you. But it's other people who are difficult. It's not you, it's them. That is projection. Or when you're a liar, you accuse other people of being a liar. Uh, you know, you are uh, awful and you accuse other people of being awful. Many times when we argue with people and we accuse them of certain things, often we ourselves are also uh, that way. Accuse others of being unreasonable, guess what? You're probably unreasonable too. We often do, want, do not want to admit things about ourselves and we accuse people of the very things that are actually wrong with us. We do that a lot. Next time you accuse someone of something, ask yourself, is that actually true about you? There's a good chance it actually is. You accuse other people of being crazy? Maybe you're the one who's crazy. It could be. It's not always the case, but we do often project. We don't wanna admit the truth about ourselves, and we basically, when we project, we just say that it's other people who are crazy. It's other people who are difficult. It's other people who are aggressive or sexually deviant or something like that. Not you. All right, you're fine. That's called projection. We all do it. There's also regression. Do not get regression confused with repression. Repression is when you make yourself forget something. Regression is when you behave like a child. You regress. It's like you go back to an earlier stage of functioning. So regression is when you return to a childlike way of functioning. So here's an example, not really bad, this example, but let's say you go to college, move away from home, you're living there at the university campus or something like that. So you're at the university. At college, usually a community college, usually you don't live there. 
and you still live at home. But let's say you go to the university and there you are living in the dorms or something and in college for the first time and you're scared. Okay, so what do you do? You call mommy for support. Or maybe you keep going back during the weekend if you live nearby. You need to go back to mommy and daddy, right? To make you feel better because you're scared. That's regression. It's not that bad, but basically you're behaving a little bit more like a child. Let me give you another example that's uh, actually more negative. When an adult, you know, throws a fit and starts screaming and shouting and starts acting crazy and throwing things, you know what that adult is doing? That adult is throwing a tantrum, behaving just like a child. That is regression. There are positive forms of, of regression. There's also negative forms of regression. When you're, uh, let's say, on a date and you're a little bit nervous, a little bit shy, so you start kind of uh, poking at the person with your finger or something like that. And the person says, uh, you know, like, what are you doing? Stop doing that. Like, ouch, that hurts. And you keep poking them. You're kind of just kidding around with them, so to speak. You're trying to break the ice. You're trying to make yourself feel better. Or if you're at the beach with that person, maybe you start splashing water on the person, trying to kind of lighten the mood. That's also regression. You're acting more like a child and it can make you feel better. But there are also very negative forms of regression. I'll give you another example. And this uh, often happens as well. What happens when, as often when uh, you have a, a couple, let's say, and you know, they have children and stuff like that, and then they, they break up, they get divorced. What will often happen is that maybe one or maybe both of them, or maybe none of them if they're, you know, if they don't regress, but regression can take the form of uh, basically someone who's divorced starts, starts acting like an irresponsible teenager again and starts partying and drinking and having not unprotected sex and acting crazy. When this person happens to be some 40 something year old that has children that needs to behave more like an adult and they're not, they start acting like an irresponsible child again. That's regression. And by the way, when they do that, they will often get themselves in trouble. You know, they should behave differently. There's people counting on them. Rationalization. Rationalization sounds complicated, it's not. Rationalization is when you just try to justify something to yourself. You try to make it seem like something's acceptable. Something that would otherwise make you feel uncomfortable, give you anxiety. You make excuses, basically. You try to make it seem like it's okay. So you say you don't need to study. You don't wanna study. You know, it's annoying. So you rationalize. You say, you know what, I don't need to study. I'll be fine. The exam probably won't be that hard. That's rationalization. You know you should study. You wanna get a good grade. But you rationalize, I don't, I don't need to study, I'll be okay. And then you fail, okay? That's what happens. Or you rationalize things to yourself, you know? You had a one night stand and you feel kinda, you know, bad about that a little bit. But you rationalize and you say, you know what? I'm only human, I have needs, I'm not perfect. Or you say, I was drunk, you know? It's no big deal. That's rationalization. We do it all the time. It's a lot of things that we do that are probably not that acceptable or maybe things we believe, but we rationalize things. Hey, you rationalize voting for Trump or voting for Hillary. If you voted for Hillary in the last election or whoever you're gonna vote for next, you have your rationalizations. Politicians, you know, eh, they're, they're all a little bit slimy, a little bit, eh, you know, that's my opinion, you know, but, uh, we rationalize our choices, right? Why we vote for this person or that person. Nobody's perfect. And, uh, you know, we make excuses. That's what we're doing for our behavior or for what we believe. We rationalize war, right? We say that, well, we need to defeat the enemy. The enemy is, is evil, things like that. The truth is that the enemy is probably just like you. But you rationalize that or countries do that, or the leaders do, to go to war and basically go and kill those people that they have disagreements with. But it's a rationalization. War is a very awful, evil thing, but we rationalize it and make it seem like it's okay. I'm not saying it's not necessary, you know, many times it is, but it's a very horrible thing 
and we make excuses to make it seem like it's not so bad so that we can motivate people to do these things that are actually awful, motivate someone to kill someone and go to war. Displacement, another defense mechanism. Displacement is when you basically uh, shift your impulses from a threatening target or an unavailable target to another. So someone made you mad, but you can't take it out on them. Let's say your boss pissed you off. You came, you know, came to work late one day, your boss called you an idiot, said that he should fire you, but you know, he just doesn't want to time, take the time to train somebody else, but, but you're a piece of crap and he should fire you and, and that you're just, you're an idiot, right? He says that to you. You get pissed off, but you can't take it out on your boss. You can't beat up your boss. You'll get fired. You'll get arrested, thrown in jail, right? So you get mad, you hold it in, and then you get home later on and you kick the dog. You stupid mutt, get out of the way. Or you take it out on your spouse. Okay, you, you come home and you give your spouse hell. And you start arguing with them and yelling at them for any little thing. You're in a bad mood. You are displacing, that's displacement. We often displace anger. We're mad at someone else, mad at someone and we take it out on somebody else. We all do it from time to time. And then there's sublimation. Subli sublimation sounds complicated. Uh, it's one of the more difficult ones to understand. It's not really that complicated as long as you understand it. The word is, the word makes it sound complicated. But sublimation is very useful actually. It's a way you can make yourself feel better. Sublimation is when you transform unacceptable impulses, unacceptable energy into something more acceptable. So let's say you have a very strong sex drive, a lot of sexual desire, very horny person. What do you do? You decide that you're gonna become an artist and you're gonna specialize in painting nudes. You're gonna paint nude women or a sculptor and your models are all nude. That way you can turn that sexual energy into something useful. By the way, Picasso did that a lot. Picasso um, basically, um, you can tell the guy had a lot of sexual energy and it drove his art. If you look at some of his art, he painted flowers that look like vaginas, he painted, uh, you know, a lot of nudes. He's not really known for a lot for his nudes, but if you see some of the things that he painted, right, a lot of sexual stuff behind it. Um, but that's, that's what, uh, he had a strong sex drive. And the guy wasn't loyal, he cheated a lot. But a lot of that sexual energy also fueled his art. But it's not just sexual energy, it goes to be aggressive energy. If you have a lot of aggressive energy, you can turn that into something useful. Rather than just getting into a lot of fights and getting into trouble, you can become a boxer, right? Go train, go become a boxer. A lot of these uh, uh, boxers, believe it or not, um, a lot of aggressive energy. And they used to get into a lot of trouble. And they started training, they got a coach, and they turned it into something useful. And some of them have become very successful because of that. You've heard of Mike Tyson? He was one of those guys. Got into a lot of trouble, you know, until somebody, you know, tell him he, told him he should start training to be a boxer. Took him in, coached him. Became world champion at some point. Was dominant, right? That's what fueled him. I can, let me tell you about the other useful ways that you can transform these unacceptable impulses into something more useful. Stuff that I do, that's to do with my bike riding as well, okay? There are many times that I feel stressed out. It could be about work, could be about my wife. My wife, very difficult, by the way. She yells at me a lot, she's mean, okay? Sometimes I get so pissed off, right? And it's, it's stressful to be pissed off. It's a form of stress, okay? You're really pissed off. Maybe it could be about work or about your relationships or the kids or something. And you feel like you just need to do something. You should not beat up the wife. Don't beat up the kids. What do I do? I basically put my bike on my, uh, you know, in my, on my bike rack in my car. I head out and I ride my bike. I go up those hills. I ride for like two hours. I come back and I'm fine. I'm over it. Okay. Um, I might also choose to do some yard work. If I'm upset, I'm mad at the wife and 
having a bunch of fights, I'll just leave the house and sometimes I'll just go outside and I'll work on the yard. You gotta use that energy for something useful. Another example, let's say you go to class and your instructor calls you an idiot, says you're stupid and you'll never amount to anything. Don't use that energy for something negative. Don't cuss him or her out and get yourself thrown out. Don't try to beat them up and get kicked out of the college, things like that, and get arrested. Basically, you know, tell them or just think to yourself, yeah, you think I'm an idiot, you think I'm gonna amount to nothing, I'll show you. And that can motivate you to become a better student and actually to become successful, to show those people that you can be successful. Hey, what about your partner leaves you, right? Says you're fat and ugly, and they leave you, and no one's gonna ever like you. You feel awful. Use that to motivate yourself. If you need to, you don't have to, but use that to motivate yourself, you know, to go to the gym, you know, to become healthier and even make yourself better. And so then he can look at you and, and so you, he can look at you and say, wow, what happened to you? Damn, what did I leave you for? You know, that kind of stuff, you know? There's plenty of people who have done things like that and have turned their lives around because somebody pissed them off, somebody told them something was impossible, and then they use that to fuel themselves, to motivate themselves to change. And sometimes we need to do that. We need to turn that energy into something useful. Identification is easy, but you, when you identify with someone to make yourself feel better about yourself. So you feel inspired, let's say about your older sibling. Your older sibling becomes successful or gets into UCLA, and you feel good. Wow, if they can do it, I can do it. That's identification. Or you identify with your sports team, right? Yeah, you identify with the Lakers. They're a good team, right? When they win, you feel good. You feel like you've won. That's identification. There's also less healthy ways to identify. You identify with brands, right? You drive a BMW so you can feel like you're successful, like you've made it. That's identification, but it's meaningless, okay? Or you identify with, uh, you know, with a certain church group, or a certain political party, right? All to make you feel better about yourself, make you feel like you're something, that you're successful or something like that. It's all identification. In reality, you don't need that to feel good about yourself, but we do it all the time to make ourselves feel better. We wanna identify with successful others or successful things or brands to make us feel better about ourselves. Let's see where we are. Let's keep going, we're not yet halfway okay um let's talk now about freud's psychosexual stages of personality let's talk about his the stages of his personality theory he has a personality theory and he has certain stages his theory of personality is also a theory of development so here's some things here just an introduction to the stage theory freud stage theory according to freud we develop in five stages okay five stages we all go through and there's a pleasure area uh, associated with uh, most stages. For some, it's not clear. When you use that pleasure area, right, that uh, uses energy. So you satisfy that pleasure area and that uses up energy, it uses up motivation. If you derive too much pleasure in that way, use that pleasure area too much or too little, it can lead to fixation. Let's say you don't get enough satisfaction enough of that kind of pleasure. So you may become fixated, you might feel stuck and you might be driven to satisfy that need. Or maybe you satisfy that need too much. You know, you can also be stuck, okay? Because you keep doing, you know, similar things or the same things to, try, to just try to satisfy that urge. Think about sex as an example, right? One of the pleasure areas is the genitals. Right, you become, you can become fixated. Let's say you're totally deprived, you know, as an adult. Well, all you can think about is sex, right? You're not getting any. And you know, you're so eager and you wanna get some. So there you are, you know, you're uh, trying to meet people, you're going out, trying to find someone, maybe even looking at pornography or something. You're fo really focused on doing this. You're not getting enough. Or maybe you are too much into it. 
And then, well, what are you doing? Well, again, you're watching a lot of pornography. You're trying to sleep with people, right? Uh, maybe more than one. And it's still a problem. You're still stuck. It's a fixation. Well, that's just one example. Let's talk about the stages so we can understand fixations, because they're not all sexual. That's just an example that fits better. So psychosexual stages of development. You've heard of these probably somewhat, a little bit maybe. Um, the first stage of Freud's theory is called the oral stage. Birth to about one year of age, maybe one and a half. You don't have a monitor. Okay. Um, so the dominant source of pleasure uh, during the oral stage is the mouth. The mouth. Infants are all about the mouth. Sucking, biting, swallowing, breastfeeding, right? That's how infant derives ple derive pleasure. It makes a lot of sense. You see an infant crawling around the floor, a little toy there that they like, they'll pick up that toy, they'll put it in their mouth. That's how infants derive pleasure, according to Freud. Eventually, you need to outgrow this and move on to the next stage. But if you don't outgrow it, and you, can, and you become fixated, and that, mean, that means you're stuck at the oral stage. So maybe you're, you're grown, you've grown up already, and you, uh, you're an adult, but you are uh, now as an adult, oral incorporated. That means you still derive most of the pleasure through the mouth. So you're too concerned with oral things, with eating, you overeat, or you have a drinking problem, or you smoke, or you do drugs through the mouth, right? You still get most of your pleasure through the mouth, just like that infant. I mean, you're really concerned with kissing and things like that. Teenagers can be that way. And, you, as a, and, and as far as your personality, you can also be very optimistic, you know, and things that think that things are gonna be okay, and kind of gullible and passive. You're kind of like that child. You know, things are gonna be okay, still getting your satisfaction through the mouth. You're, you're like that infant that's being bottle fed or breastfeed, breastfed, things are gonna be okay. You don't have to do much. You know, just keep getting your pleasure through the mouth. You can be dependent on others, other people and oral objects you know, like alcohol, drugs, and things like that. But you are dependent, optimistic, gullible, passive, you know, just gonna do your drugs, hang out, things will be okay, you know, that kind of stuff. Oral incorporated. Or you can be the opposite, oral aggressive or oral sadistic. So things didn't go very well for you when you were at the oral stage, didn't get enough, enough satisfaction from the mouth or you experienced some negative things. So instead you experience hatred, frustration, I mean, you ex maybe you experienced hatred, frustration during teething. That's what happened, okay? When you were, uh, that, you know, when you were an infant, you know, started developing those teeth and that it was painful. Maybe you didn't, weren't like uh, proper, you know, you weren't breastfed, maybe properly breastfed. You were weaned too early or weren't properly bottle fed. You were neglected maybe. So you weren't properly satisfied orally, according to Freud. So as an adult, you're pessimistic. Can't count on people. You learn that they're not going to really treat you well. They didn't satisfy your oral needs. So you're pessimistic as an adult. You can be hostile and aggressive. You don't like people. You don't believe in people. You can make sarcastic, inviting remarks. You can be mean and aggressive with your mouth by saying mean things, being sarcastic, saying things that are mean, basically. That's the oral aggressive type. They're negative. They're pessimistic. They're mean with their mouth. And then there's the people who are oral incorporated who still derive pleasure through their mouth mostly and are gullible and passive and pessimistic, dependent. Let's keep going. There's also the anal stage, the anal stage of development. One to about three years of age, maybe two to four around there, depending on which book you read. So with the anal stage, um, the dominant source of pleasure is the anus. It's about potty training. That's what it's about. You might want to add there, potty training. Okay. So the dominant source of pleasure is the anal, the, the anus. Okay. It's about going to the bathroom, right? Peeing and pooping. Pooping is most important. Being potty trained. You get to a certain age, maybe age two or so, maybe three, and your parents try to potty train you. Say, okay, now you need to learn how to use the potty. You need to go right in the potty. No more diapers, you need to go. And they sit you there and they want you to go. They kind of try to tell you what to do. Try to get you to control your anus. You can't just go whenever, wherever you want. You need to hold it. 
okay? Because you're not going to be using diapers anymore, and then you need to go to the potty, and you need to release it there. Depending on how potty training goes, how the anal stage goes, uh, you may have problems in, as an adult. You might have a fixation. You might have some problems. Fixated means, by the way, it means that you're overly focused on something. So you can be the anal retentive type. If you're anal retentive, it means that, you know, you develop too much control during potty training. You were easily potty trained. You like potty training. You find it easy to control yourself. And as an adult, you're overly controlling. You're very orderly, stubborn, stingy. Things have to be a certain way. You have to make the decisions. You have to have things a certain way. And that's called being anal retentive. You are controlling. And by the way, people who are controlling are very difficult people. I know that because my wife is that way. Things have to be a certain way. The house has to be clean. You cannot walk in with your shoes that you were using outside. There are all these rules and all this stuff, and they drive people crazy. They're very controlling. They want to tell you what to do and how to do it, when to do it, and what to think and all that stuff. Anal retentive, right? They took easily to potty training. They developed control, but they, like, they developed too much control, and they like control too much. And there are those that can be at the other extreme, anal expulsive, anal aggressive. These are the ones that didn't like potty training. They, had, you know, they developed too little control during potty, potty training. So instead they became angry and reacted against potty training. They got mad, they cried, they didn't want to be potty trained. It's difficult. As adults, these people, their personality is, they're messy, wasteful, cruel, and destructive. They don't control themselves. They're not clean, right? They put things anywhere, they throw things anywhere. Wasteful, right, with money. They'll just spend it and won't think too much about it. They'll do what they want, they'll be cruel and they'll say mean things, destructive, aggressive. They don't control themselves. That's all so bad. They'll do whatever they want, you know, act on their impulses. Don't control themselves, that's bad. Being too controlling is bad. Not being controlling and not having enough control of yourself is also bad. For each of these that we're talking about, by the way, it's healthy to be somewhere in the middle. Yes, you need to have some control over your life, right? You need to be some, a little bit controlled. You need to have some order, some strategy for your life. You need some control. Too much is bad, okay? You drive people crazy. And you, you have obsessive compulsive disorder, okay? If the control issue gets too bad, you can have OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder. And anal expulsive uh, just means you don't like to control yourself. And you're mean and destructive and aggressive. Don't control your sexual aggressive impulses. Uh, you know, you're also not, very, not a very good person to be around. So it's good to be somewhere in the middle. You know what, um, guys? Um, the next stage is the phallic stage. And I am going to stop there so we can have a little bit of time to talk about things. We're about halfway. <laughs>